So in this lecture, I'd just like to review a couple of miscellaneous additional C++ features. Not so much because I, I think it's important that you know them, although they're useful things to know. It's more to illustrate for you uh, interesting things that happen uh, when language designers decide to uh, make changes, uh, uh, add certain features and functionality to the language, and you know how those those decisions and those changes ripple their way through a whole bunch of different things. All right, so there's a list of things here, um, and if you stay to the end, I will give you the answer to the difficult interview question. So, um, synonyms. Um, so I, uh, you remember from, from types and type names that C++ has a very uh, rich syntax for declaring what the types of things are, and, and oftentimes it's a pain because oftentimes we have really, really long type names and they're, they're, they're difficult to keep track of. And so uh, C, and also C++, uh, has a keyword called type def. It's unfortunate they chose the word type def because it sounds like you're defining a type. You're not defining a type. You're, you're defining a synonym. Okay? And you just when you use the type def keyword, you're, you're creating a synonym for a type. So, the examples here illustrate this. Type def int integer says that integer is defined to be an int. It's just a synonym. Everywhere your program from this point on sees uh, integer, it uses int. And these various uh, special types that you've seen from time to time, uh, size t, uh, which is you know the size of something, uh, the, the size of a string or the, or the size of a map or whatever, that's just type def to some big unsigned integer. Right? It's just the convenience. Um, and it's everything about the type name. So if I say type def char star char pointer, uh, that means that char pointer is a char star. So char pointer, char ptr, is a alias for a um, uh, for a pointer character. You don't have to type the whole thing out. This really only gets terribly useful, and, and in fact, this is one of the more common places that it's used, when you have these big complicated function signatures, right? So in this example, um, I want to declare a pointer to a function that takes a character and returns a pointer to an integer. That's an awful lot of stuff to have to type all the time, an awful lot of stuff to make sure you get right. So whenever you have stuff like this, what you usually will see is, as somebody does a type def for it, Everywhere the symbol func pointer appears, it means something that's a pointer to a function that takes a single character that returns a pointer to an int. It's nice. It's readable. That's great. Splendid. And this was in C, and so it landed in C++, and everything's great. And then we added some new stuff to C++, and then we discovered, wow, some of the stuff that, that we want to do in C++ breaks type defs. In particular, type defs don't support templates, and uh, this became a problem. So they had to add a new syntax uh, to C++11 to support templates. So um, you've seen using using namespace something or other. This is an extension of the definition of using, or I can say using a particular template type name T using my vec. That means a standard vector of type T. So it's basically a way of templating a type def. Um, and uh, I suppose there were reasons that they just didn't say template type name T type def. I guess this was cleaner. I guess this was easier. But it means that now there's two different ways to do type defs. And it turns out that um, you can say, um, I, I believe you can say, using integer equals int if you want to, uh, and who knows, maybe they'll deprecate type def. Uh, maybe not. Uh, but if you want to type def something that uses templates, you got to use this new syntax. Okay. Let's take another example of a perfectly reasonable idea to add to a language that as soon as it got added, um, it had implications that, that rippled through a lot of things in the language. Const. Const is a great idea. Const tells the 
compiler that the item in question is a constant and can't be changed. That, that's terrific. That's a very useful thing. But const, I guess, ought to be able to be applied to more complicated things. And, and, and what does that mean when it happens, right? Suppose we try and make const function arguments. Suppose we try and make const pointers, etc., etc. What does all that mean? And, and how does that ripple through uh, the language? So one thing I can do is I can say, well, uh, this argument to this function is a const. If I declare that an argument to a function is a const, that means that the function can't change the value of the argument. Now remember, uh, when you call a function, you're getting a copy of the value. But if you call a function and pass it a pointer, or call the function and pass it a reference, you can follow that reference or follow that pointer and, and, and change what they point to, change what they refer to. Um, maybe you don't want to let the user do that. Maybe you want to efficiently call a function by passing in a reference to something. But you want to make sure that that reference can be followed to be read, but can't be followed to be written. Great, just make it a, a const reference, and that'll accomplish it. Um, if your function returns something, and whatever it returns, you don't want people to be able to change it, declare the return type to be const. Uh, that means that whatever's returned is a constant and, and can't be changed. Um, this is particularly useful if you have a function that returns a reference to something and you don't want somebody to take what the function gives it and make changes to it, right? You have some object that, that you're managing and, and you might have a getter that lets people have a reference to it, but you don't want them to be able to make a change to it. You just want them to be able to look at it, make it a const, re const return value. If it, a function is declared to be const reference to something function name, then whatever comes back from the function is a reference that can't be changed, and that seems like a good thing. So let's complicate it a little more. Let's add more interesting things, right? What does a const pointer mean? Well, well, this is an interesting thing. Um, when we talked about pointers, remember we said that pointers had two natures. Pointers have a... Um, pointers have... The, the fact that it's a pointer, the fact that it's a variable that contains a memory address, and then there's some notion that there's something that that pointer points to. Maybe I want to say, here's a pointer, and you can follow that pointer to get to the data, but you can't write to any of that data. Um, or maybe I don't want the pointer to change. So I can have a const char star, or I can have a char star const, or a const char star const. Uh, I can make one or both of those things constant. Uh, and, and you have to allow for it to be in either place or both because of the fact that a pointer has um, two natures. It has the memory address, and it has what it points to. Right? So I can have a pointer. I can't change what it points to, but I can change the pointer. Or I can change what it points to, but I can't change the pointer itself, or both. Here's another thing about const. Um, I can have a const int, I can have a const pointer, I can have a const reference. Can I have a const class? Sure. Why not? I can have a const class just like I can have a const int. C++ wants to be consistent and, and allow you to use the same concepts throughout the language. So the type system lets you have a const class. The entire class is const. Nothing about that class can ever be changed. Okay. Now, that means that you can't make any changes to the function, you, uh, to, the, to the class. You can't uh, change any of the members. That might be more than you want. Maybe you want to make certain members constant, right? Um, maybe some particular class member uh, is a constant and uh, you never want it to change, so you can just declare that individual member constant. Or maybe you want to say, here's a function that is safe to call on a 
constant class. And it's safe to call on a constant class because it doesn't change anything about that class. So uh, the best way to illustrate this is getters and setters. A getter just gets a value. It doesn't make any change to the class. And so that's a function that could be declared as being a const function. Const is, the keyword is placed after the function and after the arguments there. That indicates to the compiler that this method will never change anything anywhere in the class. And, you know, for a getter, that's what it does, right? Um, so there's two interesting things about that. From the standpoint of the caller, when the compiler is trying to call this method, and it's trying to call it on a, uh, on a class that is constant, it knows it's safe to do it. And on the, the method side, if you declare a class um, method to be const like this, and then you write code inside it to actually try and write to the class, it won't compile. The constness gets enforced. Now, this was taken to the nth degree by adding Another keyword related to constness, mutable. An item declared to be mutable is an item that is allowed to be changed even if the class is declared const. So it's another way of saying that this thing is always writable even if the class in which it is contained is declared to be const. You can probably imagine certain uh, uh, situations where you might want to do this. You know, certain kind of temporary variables maybe that, that are uh, used across calls to methods, um, uh, sort of other global things like that. Um, you might want to have classes be mostly const, but still have some other little piece of them be unconst, so you declare those things mutable. Okay, let's take another um, idea from C that moved into C++ and then had to be extended, and that's typecasting. We talked about this when we talked about types. The idea behind typecasting is you put a type name in parentheses, and you have that type name in parentheses before an expression. And this says to the compiler, Treat this thing like it's of type, that type name. Okay, and, and, and that works, you know, it really works just fine. Um, it, it treats it like it's that type. It doesn't particularly check if it's that type. Um, it, it doesn't actually create new methods or anything like that. Excuse me, it doesn't create new objects. It just treats an existing object as if it is another type. Typecasting is usually used to cast back and forth between void star. Uh, malloc returns a void star, and you typecast the result to a pointer to whatever you, you wanted. Um, but other than that, this is, generally speaking, sometimes a little scary. Uh, because what it really is saying is, all that important type-checking stuff that you did, you should ignore that. So generally speaking, in C++, these kinds of, of typecasts are somewhat deprecated, and some C++-style typecasts were added. These are the four different kinds of C++ typecasts. Um, static cast, dynamic cast, const cast, and reinterpret cast. Now, um, you can think of static cast as a compile time type safe cast. So whereas the old style typecast ignored all the type rules and just treated the thing like it's whatever you tried to cast it to, a static cast checks to make sure that this particular conversion is allowed. That's safe. Dynamic casting is actually much more interesting. Um, uh, this idea uh, is a kind of typecasting that is aware of inheritance in object-oriented programming inheritance hierarchies. 
again. So uh, the idea is that you try and dynamically cast something to a particular type, and it will only work if it really is of that type. The best illustration of this is something from Programming Assignment 3 and 4. Right? We, we have this thing called a parse tree. Right? And all of these other classes that we defined in parsetree.h are all children of parse tree. So, for any given class in that class hierarchy, because of polymorphism, we know that one of those classes can actually be regarded as being of two types. The iconst class could be an iconst, and it could be a parse tree. Could be treated as an iconst, could be treated as a parse tree. And we know that if we come at that an instance of that object with a polymorphic pointer, with a pointer to parse tree, uh, we will, at runtime, dynamically figure out what the class is, look into the virtual methods table, call the right virtual functions, away it goes. But suppose you really just want to know if it's the right type. You can do a dynamic cast. If I want to know if my parse tree pointer really actually, honest to gosh, points to an iconst, I take the pointer to parse tree and I dynamic cast it to iconst star. And if, at runtime, I find out that the parse tree pointer is actually pointing to the thing I'm trying to cast it to, if this parse tree is also an iconst, this dynamic cast will work. If it's a pointer, and you try and dynamic cast and it fails, it returns null. If it's a um, pointer and it can be dynamically cast that way, it returns a valid value. If instead of using a pointer you use a reference, it fails. It throws an exception. Um, there are other kinds of casts. You can const cast something to remove the const from an object. Seems a little unsafe to me. Um, and there, there's certain narrow cases where you, you might want to use it, but usually it shouldn't be used. And then there's the reinterpret cast which is the old-timey uh, C-style, very unsafe um, typecasting, which they kept around. Okay, let's go into another couple of interesting things, right? So um, we defined that um, when you create an object, you can declare how that object uh, can be constructed. Right? And in one of the examples I gave when we talked about operator overloading, I pointed out that say uh, you created a, a, a class and you had a constructor for the, that class and the constructor takes an integer. So what you're really saying there is I can automatically, given an integer, upconvert that integer to an instance of that class. That's called an implicit conversion. And the compiler knows how to do that. Just like the compiler knows how to convert an int to a float if it needs to do floating point arithmetic. Um, in the previous example we gave with operator overloading, the compiler knows how to convert an int to an item. Right? So the object has a constructor that takes an int, and the object is used as a function parameter, and the programmer passes an int, then the compiler constructs an instance of the object, and away it goes. So it's great. It'll automatically upconvert things from one type to another. Unless you don't want to do that. Suppose you don't want to do that. That might not. That might be something that you don't want to do. That might be a, a bad idea. Uh, and so you can say, I'll allow you to, to create an object from an integer. I'll allow you to create an instance of my object for an integer using this constructor, but I'll only allow it if you explicitly say, that you want to do it. So you use the explicit keyword. Here's an example. Notice the only difference between our standard thing uh, that we've seen before is the explicit keyword before the constructor there. What that means is it won't automatically convert an integer to an x unless you explicitly say 
make an x out of the integer. So the first line there, x v1 equals 10. If the constructor wasn't explicit, then the compiler would say, oh, I know how to turn an, an integer into an x, so I'll just do it for you. But because I made it explicit, that first line of code there isn't valid. Second line of code is valid because I'm explicitly saying, yes, I want to take uh, an integer, convert it into an x by, by calling the constructor directly, by calling it explicitly. So why would you want to do this? Um, you know, maybe it's expensive to create these objects. Um, maybe you don't really want to automatically convert an integer to some really big honking object. Maybe there's collisions. Maybe you have a bunch of different things that you might be able to create out of an integer and stuff won't compile, so you just make things explicit. Okay. Now, um, sometimes things get added to a language because uh, we really like the thing that was in this other language. Um, and exceptions is a good example of that. Exceptions is a pretty good thing in Java. I mean, these things can be, I, I think these things can probably be a little overused, but uh, in certain circumstances, exceptions are a great thing. And so C++ added support for them. Um, and not only did they add support for them, they added support for them pretty much exactly the way Java handles it. There's there's try and catch, right? And, and you know what those things are, because the same as Java. And I guess it's the same as same as Python, or close enough, right? There's a, there's a try block. There's what to do if an exception happens inside that try block. You catch the exception, you look at it. Now, in Java, an exception is an object. Everything's an object. So if you want to throw an exception in Java, you have to create a new object of the right type and then throw it. Um, C++ doesn't do that. You can throw anything you want. You can, you can throw an integer. You can throw a string. You can throw an instance of a class. It's fine. Now, one thing I didn't really talk about when I talked about functions is, you know, how this actually gets implemented under the hood is really, really complicated, right? Because what is throw? Throw is, um, you know what, return from this function right now. But maybe I'm not really returning directly to the caller. Maybe the, maybe the try block is three layers up the stack, right? And, and so if that's the case, I have to do this complicated thing where I unwind the stack. If, if function A has a try block to catch a particular exception, and function B gets called by A in that try block, and, and B calls C, and C generates the exception, I have to cleanly finish up that function call of C. I have to deallocate all the, the local variables on the stack. I have to cleanly unwind things and clean up the activation record. And then I'm in B, and there's no, there's no catch for it in B, so I have to cleanly clean up after B and unwind the call to B, and then throw it all up into A. So basically, throwing an, an exception causes the end of this function action to be performed for every single function from where the throw happens, all the way up the chain until you get to the try block where, where it's caught. And if, just like in Java, if you don't catch an exception, it causes the program to die, and it prints out, oh, this exception happened. So, you know, here's an example. Um, there's actually a whole bunch of exceptions defined in the header standard accept, and you can use them. So, you know, I, I wrote an example program here where uh, f of x is not allowed to be used with values of x greater than 100. So if you call it with x greater than 100, it throws an exception, throw standard logic error, one of the kinds of exceptions, and you give it a string. And then, you know, you on the bottom I show you, you know, you, you call f inside a try block. Uh, that'll cause the exception to be thrown, and you catch it in the catch block. Notice you'll see that the catch block declares that the thing that you're trying to catch is listed as a reference. Uh, you probably want to do that because you don't want to be copying objects around. There's this single object having to do with the exception that you're throwing. Have a reference to it and so that you don't have to make extra copies of it. And the object itself, the, 
in your logic error object E has methods as you can call. You can you can take a look at that string. I think the method is called what. <laughs> so you can you can take the exception and find out what happened and print the string out. Okay. Now let's talk about how pointers got changed. Right? Because you know we've all had fun with pointers. Basically a smart pointer is a class that contains a pointer and a reference counter. It keeps track of how things get copied, it keeps track of things getting referenced and dereferenced, and it automatically cleans up the allocation for you. How does it keep track of uh, copying things around? Well, it overloads the assignment operator all over the place, and it overloads the, um, the pointer dereferencing operator. So let me give you a quick example of this. Here's a little sample piece of code. Uh, you'll see that I've declared a class called my class, and it's got a tag. And you know, just to keep track of this, I, my constructor says, "Oh, I'm constructing tag, whatever the number is." And then when I call the destructor, or when the destructor gets called, it says, "Oh, I'm destructing whatever that tag is," and I can get the tag. Great. Okay. Now, in this program, I I make a new my class. And it's it's uh, one, and I save it in um, in the pointer p. I'm going to make a copy of that, right? So p and q both point to that same object. Then I make a shared pointer to my class. Um, sp is a shared pointer to my class, and I use it as I, I, I say to it, um, okay, good. Um, create a new my class and keep track of that pointer in this shared pointer object. And there you go, sp2 equals sp. Cool. Now here you'll notice I just see out p, q, sp, and sp2. So when I run this program I'll expect to see some message from the constructor for my class 1. I'll expect to see a, a message from the constructor from my class 2. I'll expect to see four tag messages. Now when I run the program, I see constructing one, constructing two, one, one, two, two. Uh, the first two ones are printed out because P and Q both point to the first object. The second, the two twos are printed out because SP and SP2 are pointing to the second object. But look, destructing two gets printed out. If you go back and look at this program again, um, or if I can make this thing go back and look at this program again, Ah, I can't go backwards. Dag. If you went back and looked at this program again, you would see that although I didn't delete, um, I didn't do any kind of an explicit delete of things, the second object was in a shared pointer. When that shared pointer went out of scope, you know, when, when main returned, uh, destroying the shared pointer counted down the reference counts for the underlying object, and it realized, well, you know, that, that object now no, has nobody pointing to it anymore, so I'm just going to call the destructor for it. That's pretty cool. Right? I could create another example here where I make a function, um, you know, similar, same thing in the class. I have a function called leaks, and you'll see that leaks uh, generates an instance of my class, prints out um, the tag for it, and then returns. And then the function called no leaks creates a new my class, saves it in a shared pointer, prints out the tag, and returns. So as you might guess from the names of the functions that I chose, leaky leaks leaks. <laughs> I allocate this thing, I save it in a pointer, I print it out, and then I return, and I don't explicitly delete that. Because I don't explicitly delete that, that memory becomes lost when leaky goes out of scope. However, in the no leaks function, I'm saving the pointer in a shared pointer. The shared pointer keeps track of how many people are referring to this object, in this case, just one. When I return from this function, the shared pointer goes out of scope. It realizes that the underlying object that it controls is also going to go out of scope because it's only got one 
uh, reference to it. So it cleans it up and it calls the destructor for it. So therefore, no leaks. So I take my, my main, uh, a main function here using those two things. Right? I call leaks, I call no leaks. Um, I'll expect to see leaks print out uh, that I'm constructing 42, and it'll print out 42. I expect no leaks to print out that I'm constructing 72, and then when I return from leaks, I'll destroy it. And then here you see I've got P and Q, um, same as I did in my earlier version. I create a new object, I save it in P, I copy the pointer from P to Q. So P and Q are both pointing to that object on the heap. And I have SP and SP2, which are both shared pointers to that same object. Now, if I delete P, P doesn't point to... Um, uh, once I say delete P, I'm, I'm freeing something up on the heap. Um, that object isn't valid anymore. Uh, the compiler doesn't necessarily know that, um, and so it'll actually try and follow those pointers. I'll be using the dangling pointers, both P and Q, and I'll probably print out some garbage. Um, SP, the shared pointer, I can reset the shared pointer. That means yeah, I don't want the shared pointer to point to anything anymore. Once I do that, uh, shared pointer doesn't point to anything anymore. And you see I've commented out that line. If I tried to use SP after resetting the shared pointer, it doesn't point to anything anymore. It's a null pointer. Trying to use the null pointer would crash. I get a segmentation fault because I'm trying to reference memory address zero. But two people were pointing to that object, SP and SP2. So although I blew it away for SP by resetting SP, I didn't do anything bad to SP2, so SP2 can still use it. And you'll see when I look at the output, that's exactly what happens. Um, I construct 42, and it prints it out, and then that memory leaks. In my no leaks function, I construct 72, I print it out. When I return from the function, it goes out of scope, and I destroy it. No leaks. Then I, uh, I construct object 1, I construct object 2. Um, saying delete P frees up that memory. P and Q are now both pointing to something that's been freed, and you say, I'm using a dangling pointer, there's garbage there for some reason. But if I take SP and reset it, SP2 is still valid. I can still print 2. Uh, the last executable line of code in that main function also reset SP2. So now nobody is pointing to that object anymore. It's safe to destroy it, and it gets destroyed. A very useful object, right? This is a very useful thing. Uh, it makes memory management a lot easier. It causes some of the problems, eliminates some of the problems, uh, makes sure that you don't uh, have memory leaks, makes sure that you don't accidentally forget to uh, free up memory, makes sure that if you copy a pointer and delete it in one place, you don't really delete it in another. It's very nice. Um, more and more people are using this thing, and who knows, they may deprecate pointers and require that you use shared pointers. Okay, one or two other things as the language grew. Okay, so the language um, allows you to um, return values and, and copy things around, right? Um, so when you say x equals y, you're copying the value of y into, the, into x. So that means that you are... Um, you know, whatever value is in y gets copied into x, y still has its value. So you have two copies of that. And so, so when we say that we've defined assignment to work this way, uh, we say that the assignment exhibits copy semantics. The meaning of assignment is copying a value. And that's great, except for things that are really big, where uh, copying might be really expensive. Um, and maybe you don't want to copy things. Maybe you want to move things from one to another. So in uh, more recent versions of C++, they introduced the idea of move semantics. Okay, so see this function here, string func. 
uh, you declare a string in that function, you do something with it, and you return it, and then uh, I use it, I call the function, and I save what I'm uh, uh, what the function returns. So when the function returns, you copy s into the activation record, s gets destroyed, and then you copy the activation record, the thing from the activation record, to the copy constructor for Meister, uh, and the copy of the activation record. That's a lot of copying and destroying. So to handle this, they added a couple more new things. Um, the move constructor and move assignment. We had copy constructors and we had assignment. Now we have move constructors and move assignment. And notice that we've got two ampersands instead of one. So a single ampersand is called an L value reference and a double ampersand is called an R value reference. It's up to you to implement move. You, you, you take the resources from the source and move them to the destination and reset the source. So here's an example, right? You, um, I have a class here. It's got a, uh, a pointer to some data and some indication of the length. Now, to copy an instance of this to another instance of this, you have to allocate another chunk of memory in the destination. You have to make the data member in the destination big enough to hold the information. You have to copy each byte from source to destination. You have to set the len. Everything's great. I suppose you don't want to do that. I suppose you just want to move things. So you make a move constructor. That code there, that move constructor says, I'm going to construct this buff, this instance of buff, by moving stuff from the other guy. So I, I copy the pointer from other. I copy the len from other. And I reset the data and len of the source. Okay. So copy constructors are called for L values. Move constructors get called for R values. If the, only the copy constructor is provided, then moves and copies both use it. But you want it to be a reference to const. R values can bind to const references. And there's a thing called move, or if you want to indicate that you can move from X, you just say, oh, I want to be able to move from X. If you're dealing with really, really big objects, really, really big objects, uh, sometimes you'd want to be making all kinds of copies of those really big objects and moving from one place to another, especially moving from something that you calculated in a function back to the caller, uh, can be dramatically more uh, efficient. And that's, that's a good thing. Here's the last thing, the very last thing, and, and this is your bonus. This is your, this is your uh, bonus technical interview question. Suppose you inherit from the same base class, um, according from two different paths. So I have a class, and it has two parents, A and B, and say that up the chain of inheritance, A's got a, a base class called B, uh, excuse me, A's got a base class called base, and B's got a base class called base. So you have different parents, but eventually a common ancestor. Now, inheritance gets implemented by providing copies of the ancestors, so that means you'd be inheriting that ultimate base class twice, and you'd create ambiguities. You don't want to do that, so you allow... Uh, it, C++ allows you to declare the inheritance to be virtual inheritance. So I can say uh, class A, public B, or private B, or protected B, or I can say virtual public A, virtual public B, right? So the idea is to simply make sure that if in the course of compiling the thing there's multiple instances of that parent class, you only copy one of them. Now, if you draw a picture of inheritance like this, it, it looks like a diamond, and so this thing is called the diamond problem. And so, if somebody ever says to you in an interview, why would we want to have virtual inheritance in C++, you can look the interviewer right in the eye and you can say, well, well, of course, we, we don't want to have the diamond problem in our code, so we need to use virtual inheritance. And the interviewer will say, goodness, you're a genius. Congratulations, you get the job. So this is my gift to you. Um, so I, I hope what you see here is that as the language grew and expanded, and as 
different concepts got added to the language, those concepts got folded into and rolled into uh, other places in interesting ways. The very fact that you wanted to have const meant that cheat is a whole bunch of other things that could be const, and you have to make sure that the, those meanings are propagated consistently through the language. Um, if we have more type safety and we have dynamic binding, uh, maybe typecasting ought to be type safe. Maybe I need to be able to do certain kinds of typecasting um, with polymorphic pointers, a need that didn't exist in C. So that is that.